Look, investing in Canadian real estate is over, dude. Prices are way too high, nothing cash flows, taxes are incredibly high, and the worst thing is the Landlord Tenant Board, where tenants in Canada can do pretty much whatever they want, get away with murder, never pay rent, smash your property, and get away with it scot-free so they can do it again and again and again to the next landlord. Now, if you want to be a real estate investor and continue investing because you understand the benefits of real estate, but are too scared or unsure on continuing to do it in Canada, dude, I got what you need. See, I'm a real estate investor who's bought over 100 and 50 properties all in southern Ontario. I sold them all and now I am putting another penny in Canadian real estate because I found the way. And the way is America, baby. See, now we're investing in states like Florida, Texas, Tennessee, and Georgia, where landlords pretty much make all the rules. Prices are cut in half, cash flows way higher, taxes are way better, regulations are way better. So if you ever thought about this as well, but you've been tangled in a web of tax applications, zoning, regulations, how to do it, this video is gonna solve all of those questions. So grab your snacks, grab your coffee, and also obliterate that like button for the YouTube algorithm and and let's get into it. So first things first, we're gonna talk about financing, which this reason alone is enough to totally leave Canada completely. This is the holy grail. See, in Canada, if you wanna qualify for a mortgage for your rental property, good luck after about three to four properties. That's where most people can buy and get mortgages on their own before a Canadian bank like RBC, TD, Scotiabank, HSBC, etc., cetera, starts saying no more. You are too big of a risk, they say. You own too much real estate, they say. But you're thinking over here, dude, I only own three or four properties. What are you talking about? I wanna buy 20, I wanna buy 100, I wanna buy 150 like that fruitful investor guy I see on YouTube. And <laughs> see, you can still do that in Canada, but the only way is to get other people to bring money and get a mortgage in their name and they get the mortgage, they're on title, you're not. That's called a joint venture partnership. And that's how I bought 150 properties with none of my own money, which is a great strategy, should be utilized. We can do that in America as well. But let's just say you wanna get property number two, three, four, five, and you wanna do it on your own. Good luck in Canada. Now we'll talk about many other reasons why you shouldn't do that, but right now we're talking about just about financing, and that is the banks in Canada are so meticulous which is a good thing. That's why we didn't have a 2008 crisis explosion like the US had, because our country wasn't giving out shitty mortgages to people who had a credit rating under 500 for a million dollar home. We weren't doing that. We have all these hoops and steps for people to go through income checks and you gotta give your taxes and your credit card statements. You gotta show where the money came from, from this account to this account. You gotta have at least 5% down. We gotta run your numbers and the worst case scenario is you gotta be able to afford this house as if the mortgage payment was 2% more on the interest rate. All these things to make sure that in the worst case scenario, this Canadian can still afford the house. Well, when you own two properties or three properties, that's when that strategy starts working against you. Cause see, maybe rental property B rents for 1500 bucks a month, but they're only gonna look at half of the rent income in Canada. Even though it rents for 1500, TD, RBC, all these banks say, no, we're only gonna pretend the rent is only 750. And you're like, okay. So that means you are in negative cash flow by maybe 750 bucks just on that one property. If you have three properties, that's a lot of negative cash flow. And then they gotta take your income and support it for the next, that's when it starts getting real ugly. I mean, nobody is gonna qualify at a certain point unless you make like a half a million dollars a year. And even then, probably by property seven, your numbers aren't gonna look that good either. Now that's Canada. In America, it's totally different. See, here in America is capitalistic and the lenders want your business. Unlike Canada, where there's only like really five banks, TD, Scotiabank, RBC, Bank of Montreal, whatever, there's only like five or seven of them. And they create all the rules and they're all pretty much the same. Whereas in America, there's thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of banks offering different products, trying to get your business. It's not a monopoly like Canada. So as a foreign national, as a Canadian, trying to buy real estate in America, there's this program that you're gonna be using called a DSCR, a debt service coverage ratio mortgage. And what that basically means is a commercial mortgage. Now, if you're buying multifamily in Canada, you understand what this is, because it's the same type of mortgage. See, this is when they look at the property first you second, whereas in Canada, they look at you first, 
property second. What that basically means in America, they just care about the property. They don't care about you. They care about the property. How much is it worth? And most importantly, how much is it going to cash flow? See, what's super cool is when you buy a property here, all the banks require for this program is 30% down. So yes, more than 20% that you're used to in Canada, but the properties are so cheap down here. Whatever, 30%, sure. I mean, for example, we're buying properties just outside of Houston, Texas for $160,000, $180,000. You want 30% down? Okay. So 30% down, show me where the money came from so it's not drug money. And even if it is drug money or money that you can't really show where it came from, as long as it sits in an account, a US account for more than 60 days, you can still close and use that money. They don't care where that money came from. Yeah, I wonder why there's so much money washing going on in America. But anyway, that's how the game is. So 30% down, show me where the money came from sometimes. And how much is the property going to cash flow? This is the best thing about this program. In America, they look at the rent. And if you're buying an Airbnb like we are in Florida, what's absolutely amazing is they look at the Airbnb average rent. See, they send out an appraiser, just like they would in Canada, to appraise the value of the property to make sure you're not overpaying on the property itself, naturally but they do a second appraisal while they're there on the rent. So for example, if you're buying the properties that we're buying outside of Houston, Texas for a long-term rental at 170 grand, let's say, your all-in cost for mortgage payment, property taxes, et cetera, probably gonna be somewhere around $900, 1,000 bucks a month, let's say, for easy math. But if the rent on this property is gonna be 1,400 bucks a month, which it easily is, well, there you go. You get the mortgage. Your expenses are a thousand bucks a month. The property is gonna rent out for fourteen hundred. That's a four hundred dollar positive cash flow. And you put down thirty percent down like a sucker, or at least that's what they think you are. They're like, sure, you get the mortgage. No credit check, no taxes, no credit card statement, no income verification, nothing. They don't care about your Canadian history. They don't care about your Canadian Equifax credit rating. They do not care. Your property is the first thing they look at and they're saying, this is a great deal. This idiot is putting down 30% down. What are the odds of a 30% real estate correction? Highly unlikely, almost never happens in history. So the bank's sitting over here laughing their ass off. This guy's gonna put down 30%. What are the odds of a correction that big? Probably not gonna happen. Okay, sure. And it cash flows. So if this moron does one day not pay his mortgage and we take the house back, we're getting a house at a discount. That cash flows. That already has a tenant in it. See, this is how a capitalistic bank or business thinks. This is America. Whereas in Canada, they have all the same details. They can see all the same numbers, but they go, yeah, we're Canada. What if some market obliteration happens? What if interest rates go up by 500%? Can you afford it? Is it possible? Could you carry the entire mortgage on your own? Um, there's a tenant in there. I'll rent it to somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if there was no tenant for three years, could you afford the house? And you're like, dude, that's never gonna happen. Yeah, but if, if, could you? That's the difference between Canada and America, in a nutshell. And quickly, I'll talk about the Airbnbs. It's the same thing. They'll send out an appraisal to look at AirDNA and all the uh, Airbnb income around the area. And they're gonna say, yep, your mortgage on this Florida house, you know, your all-in cost is gonna be 3,500 a month, but this property clearly shows it'll rent for $7,000 a month on average. Yeah, numbers make sense. Here you go. The mortgages I've gotten down here are the easiest transactions I've ever done for a long-term property. It's actually a friggin' joke. See, when you're a Canadian, you're used to jumping through all these hoops and getting your taxes and your credit card statements and giving your broker a, a stack this big digitally, but still, you're sending all these docs in, in America. They're like, dude, don't worry about it. Just show me your LLC formation. That's all I wanna see. Show me where the money came from. That's it. That's all the documents I need. I don't need anything else. Oh yeah, and what's your name? That's it. <laughs> like it's freaking crazy. Second thing I wanna talk about now is the price difference in real estate. Price in America is a goddamn joke. If you're from Canada in a major city like GTA or Vancouver, dude, you're gonna be laughing your ass off when you start looking at deals down here. And not even like deals, just properties on the MLS. There's freaking opportunities everywhere. In Canada, to find an opportunity to invest in on the market with a realtor is impossible. 
There's no deals. Everybody's fighting over all the properties. You got first time buyers throwing in multiple offers. That doesn't happen down here. Why? There's so much real estate. America is 10 times the size of Canada, 10 times the amount of real estate. There's houses to go around everywhere. And yeah, they talk about how they're in a housing shortage. They are technically by data claims, but not like Canada. We literally have no houses. We have no inventory. Down here, there's a ton of inventory. So this low inventory environment obviously raises prices when everybody's fighting over real estate, but the average house cost in Canada right now is like somewhere around 741,000 or something like that. So to buy a single family house, the properties I used to buy from 2012 to 2022, those properties now are about $700,000 in a good big city like Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph, right? The average single family house is about 740 grand. That mortgage payment is gonna be monstrous. And the rent, probably 3,000, 3,200 a month. It ain't gonna cash flow. It's gonna be negative cash flow by almost $1,000 or more with today's mortgage rates. Well, in Texas, for example, just outside of Houston, I can find the exact same house. A two story, three bedroom, two bath, with a garage, nice white picket fence and suburb neighborhood, nice backyard, the exact same thing you would find in a major city in Canada for $180,000. And the rent is $1,800, maybe $2,000 if it's renovated good. It's gonna cash flow so much friggin' money, require less money down, the mortgage is a billion times easier to receive. Dude, I rest my case. I should just end the video right here. That's all you need to know. Oh, and by the way, if your wheels are spinning right now, get my course right below in the description on how to invest in the US as a Canadian citizen. It has every answer in that course you're ever gonna need about financing, how to contact mortgage brokers, how to get a realtor, how to actually look for deals, how to form your corporation, all the questions that you are asking for only 17 dollars it's a huge video course check it out all your answers are there this video is just shining some light on it now the next thing i want to talk about of why you should just get the hell out of canada and stop buying real estate is landlord rights i mean if everything was the same even if house prices were the same cash flow was the same negative crap if it was the same this reason alone is enough to leave canada and never buy another rental property again so as you know in canada a tenant can do whatever they want they cannot pay you rent for up to a year they can smash your property absolutely ruin it invite friends to live with them that you didn't authorize pretty much do whatever they want and get away with it scot-free finally when they're evicted after a year of not paying rent and they can just do it again and again and again to the next guy well in red states republican states like texas florida tennessee georgia the landlord pretty much makes all the rules if you want to increase your rent because you figured out it's under market, maybe you've been renting it at $1,500 for the longest time and you kind of forgot about it and now rent is $1,800 for, on average for this exact same house you have, you can just raise it from $1,500 to $1,800 with proper notice, 30, 60 days, depending on the state, and the tenant has to pay. That's it. There's no filing to a court or to an appeal like Canada where you got to go prove of why you're doing it. Oh, you did this massive kitchen renovation and that, that, you know, that's why you're raising the rent. No, dude, there's none of that. You just fucking raise it because it's your property. And if the tenant can't pay, I guess they gots to go, period, which is the best thing. Because if you ever have a bad tenant that's not paying you rent, they're late every single month, they're breaking the property, you can just raise the rent to an insane amount, 5,000 bucks a month even though they're paying a thousand bucks a month and say rent in 60 days is 5,000 bucks a month. Oh, I can't afford that. I can't pay that. I guess you got to go period. And if a tenant doesn't pay rent and they're late, it's 45 to 60 days on average across all the States I mentioned for an eviction before the sheriff comes and literally drags them the hell out. Unlike Canada where they can appeal and extend and stay in your property for up to a year. And then the court loses the document. You got to start all over. No, 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 no. In Texas, Florida, Georgia. No, man. Okay. 45, 60 days. The sheriff's coming with a gun. It's time to get out. Next point is off market deals. Again, dude, this point alone is good enough to leave. See, in Canada to find an off market deal, which is what I had, a whole business finding motivated sellers directly buying their property at a discount and flipping it. That was my flip company. That's all we did. We were a marketing business, a wholesaling company, if you heard that term. We had the whole in-house wholesaling company trying to find the needle in the haystack motivated seller. 
keyword there, needle in the haystack. Nobody in Canada is truly financially motivated because the system protects us very well. If you go bankrupt in Canada, like you really fucked up. They give you so much lenience. They give you over a year. They'll try and figure it out with you. They're going to lower your mortgage payment. They're going to try whatever they can do. Please don't let us foreclose on your house. We don't want it. Let's figure something out. That's how the banks work. In America, it's capitalism, dude. If you don't pay your mortgage 60, 90 days, dude, your house is gone. Okay. They're, they're going to take it. They're going to re- listed on the market. They don't care. Banks here don't fucking care. So that being said, there's a lot more financial motivation here. The system is just designed in a way where it's more sink or swim in this economy. If you have a brain and you understand investing and you can read, by the way, which is (laughs) a huge thing. If you can read as an American and you you have good skills, you're going to do just fine here. All that to say, it's just a different economy here. It's sink or swim. So people are more financially motivated because shit's happening quick. They're going to lose their house. They just lost their job. They can't find a new job. They're going to lose their house. So when you start calling these people, they're way more motivated to actually sell quickly. And the crazy thing is all the information is public because America believes in freedom. Unlike Canada or Australia or the UK, all of our information is private as it should be. (laughs) I don't want people knowing what my mortgage is, how much I have left to pay on it, if I'm late on my mortgage. All that is private information. In America, it's public. We can just type on a website and see who's 90 days late or more on their mortgage payment. Who's their mortgage with? How much do they owe left on the mortgage? What's their name? What's their phone number? One website can just get all that information. So you just populate, okay, in Houston, Texas, show me who's 90 days late on their mortgage payment, has at least 100,000 of equity in their home, and go. All the names come up. You just call every single person or have someone else call them, a call center for $5 an hour, which is what we do. We have somebody call all these people and say, hey, we're the biggest home buyer around Houston, Texas. We're looking to buy more homes. Would you be interested in selling your home? And then they go, actually, I'm going to pre-foreclosure. They're going to take my house in like 30 days. I would love to sell. And then we go, like I didn't know that. Tell me more. And then we just continue on. And our person closes the deal. It's madness. I used to spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to find these types of sellers in Canada by flyering an entire neighborhood, doing Facebook ads on an entire city, blanket marketing, trying to find the needle in the haystack. Now... I can just find every needle in the haystack and just call them for two cents. Absolutely mind blowing. And the last point I want to make in this video is just the ability to scale. So if you're in Canada and you want to buy a hundred properties like I did or more, it's going to be really friggin' hard. Almost impossible. Actually, most people will not do it because the system is just designed to be sluggish and just very hard to do that. In America, it's easy because you can get theoretically unlimited mortgages. Like I said, with a DSCR mortgage, you can buy 20 houses. You can buy a hundred. You can buy a thousand. You can buy 30,000 houses. It doesn't matter. There's no cap. The banks aren't going to look at you and go, oh, you already own 10 properties. You're a major risk. They're going to be like, dude, you own 10 properties. That's dope. You're actually a sophisticated investor. We want to work with you more. It's crazy. So the ability to scale and just grow quickly is just way easier. Anyway, guys, that is the video. Like I said, get my course in the description showing you exactly how to invest in America as a Canadian citizen. All the answers you're going to have are in that course. And don't forget to smash that subscribe button because I'll see you in the next video.